Welcome to the Faith Matters Podcast. In this episode, Melissa Inouye talks with David Osler about why people leave the church and the role members have to play when loved ones leave. Melissa Inouye is a professor of Asian studies at Auckland University in New Zealand and is the author of the upcoming book, Crossings, a collection of essays, letters, and drawings that considers how Latter-day Saints can cultivate unity without leaving their distinctive gifts behind. We hope you enjoy this conversation. For more podcasts, articles, and community, go to faithmatters.org. Today, I'm really excited to talk to David Osler. David Osler is a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he's served in the church in a number of different capacities, including as a bishop, a state president, and a mission president in Sierra Leone with his wife. And David lives in Northern Virginia, and currently he's working on a book about how Latter-day Saints can do a better job of ministering to others in their congregations or their families who are struggling with difficult questions, doubts, and transitions pertaining to their faith. So I'm so grateful that you're willing to give us your time, David, to talk about your observations. Can you just get right into it and talk about what you've been learning and what you've observed? So the background for me to even get into this topic deals with a calling that I recently have shared with my wife and our stake. We were called to um, work with our leadership to help them understand why people choose not to attend church. And um, through that, we started having dialogue with people who once believed and no longer believe, with people who are struggling to know what they believe. And um, we came to an understanding fairly quickly that local leaders, meaning bishops or Relief Society presidents or people who serve in ward or state councils often really don't understand what goes on in the mind of someone who says, I used to believe, but now I don't, or I used to believe, but now I can't participate, uh, or I used to believe and I, I, I don't know what I think anymore. Um, we started to, uh, kind of doing what I would do with any project, which is try and find out what other people have said on this. Uh, we found some some good data that talks about some of the broad trends with inside the church, where there appears to be an increased number of people who, as adults, choose to no longer affiliate. Looked at data from Pew Research Study. Um, there's a psychologist or a sociologist named Darren Shurkat who has analyzed this for all major religions in the United States, and then uh, Jana Reese and Benjamin Knoll have done research specifically in Latter-day Saint uh, populations to understand the reasons why people um, uh, uh, leave or or are more people leaving. And we came to um, understand that there is a problem. More people are leaving. Um, We don't really always understand why if we're local leaders, and we often don't know how to be helpful um, when we're working with an individual or working in our congregations to to know how to to address the the concerns that are unique today. Uh, And I was particularly interested in understanding kind of culturally what happens in a congregation that causes someone to lose faith or uh, to choose not to participate. And so I created um, uh, two surveys to try and answer these questions. Uh, One survey I did with um, local leaders, again, stake and ward council members, uh, most of them were in the United States, probably about 90% were United States based, and uh, asked them, why do people leave? How big of a a problem is this in your family or in your ward? And then I found another group of people that um, are currently in the middle of a faith crisis. These are people that are unsure what they believe. They once believed wholeheartedly even. They've almost all been endowed, and now they they don't know what to believe. They're right in the middle of a faith crisis. And so I asked many of the same questions to try and compare what leaders think and what members in a faith crisis think. And the, the results are really very fascinating. I had 520 leaders respond and about 310 members in a faith crisis respond. So it's a pretty big population. Uh, and I think that there's enough data there to draw some inferences. Great. Um, I was just looking, just as a follow-up question. Um, you were talking about what happens culturally. So um, 
I guess we'll get to that um, in the next phase, but um, it seems to me that what you're saying is it's not just about kind of basic tenets of the church or doctrines necessarily. It's um, something a bit more organic or kind of complex in terms of why people experience a faith crisis. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so, um, and I wanted to understand those issues. So in addition to the broad survey that I did, I also created a focus group and had about 80 of these uh, faith crisis members, as I call them, um, be able to respond to questions to kind of get to these cultural issues. You know, what happens in a congregation? Why do I, if if I believe something differently, um, why is it difficult for me to participate? How am I received when I have a concern and I try and raise it? Where can I go to get help if I have concern about a particular doctrine or or learn something new about a church history event that causes me to question um, preconceived ideas that I've had about prophets and their roles or the divinity of the church? And um, what I learned is um, these issues are probably more common than we think. Um, So I asked um, these local leaders how prevalent uh, faith crisis is. And um, I asked them whether they have a child or a family member or a close friend, or someone in their ward that has gone through a faith crisis. And um, 97% of leaders had either a family member or a close friend who's had a faith crisis. I have children that no longer believe. Um, And I I think um, the majority of of members of the church have people that are close to them that um, uh, no longer believe. and, and, And that member then is trying to understand how to relate to them and how to help them uh, and uh, how to be kind and loving and minister. And many of us are thinking about ways to get them to come back. Um, And and those are really interesting dynamics. Um, These local leaders almost universally say that this is a problem and that they're trying to uh, find ways to solve it. So I I think in my data, it says that um, uh, 75% of all leaders uh, agree that addressing faith crisis in their ward is a very important topic. What's interesting is addressing it in their family is even more important to them. So about 85% of these leaders say that it's very important to address in their families. Maybe it's their brother or, or their husband or their adult children, or maybe they're concerned about their children growing up and how to address these issues. So it's been fascinating to see how um, concerning that is for these local leaders. Could you explain how you've defined leaders just before we get into the next section on um, the specifics, like the the reasons why people have faith crises? But before we do that, can you just, um, how are you defining leaders? So they have to be in a a presidency, an award, or a stake. Um, Uh, and they have to be active, they have to attend church. I ask questions about their level of participation. And uh, I also ask questions about their level of belief. But I disqualified any responses of people that are not in those leadership roles of in a presidency, in a young women's primary, release society, elders quorum, uh, on a high council, um, or those that, again, don't attend church. Okay, perfect. Um, Well, now that we know the kind of um, framing of your investigation, can you just talk about what you found? So um, the first area that, that may be useful to talk about is what kind of triggers a faith crisis. So um, someone who's been a return missionary and you know maybe been the president of their seminary class and is married in the temple and is faithfully serving, um, you know, what are the issues that kind of cause them to reassess their faith? And when you ask faith crisis members, these members that are that are in a faith crisis, they point to issues of church history, gender roles, the concerns about um, uh, uh, the policies of the church towards LGBTQ members. Um, they're concerned primarily about those kind of issues cause them to reassess things. Mm-hmm. Um, if you ask the local leaders, they generally focus in on Um, issues of of having conflict with leaders, um, having disagreements in the the, the ward, or um, a member sinning. 
and that those are what leaders think kind of trigger faith crisis. They couldn't be any more different in terms of the, the data and the way they perceive that. Wow, so that's actually a really big problem that there's this huge gap between um, what the leaders see as the problem and what people who are experiencing a faith crisis actually see. Um, so could you talk about, in your work, um, you talk about trust, belonging, and meaning or relevance. Um, can you go into detail about those? Um, I guess you've, you've created categories, I guess, for the kind yeah. of people you have. So someone can have a trigger that causes them to reassess their faith. But down deep, maybe like the iceberg underneath the water, lie these three issues. If I have a concern about church history, how does that affect my faith? Well, for, for some people, it causes them to, to lose trust in the institution or what their leaders, the institution's leaders have been teaching them. So if I didn't know a particular aspect of church history and find out about that in my 40s or 50s, some of these members will say, well, I felt lied to, I felt betrayed. I, I felt like when I was a missionary, I went out and, and said Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist. And now I find out, you know, he was a polygamist. And I, I feel like I can't trust church leaders to tell me the truth about the, the history of the church. Um, uh, the second, and, and, and that's not the only aspect of trust. It's not just, are they telling me the truth, but Will they help me with my faith journey? Will they tell me things that are helpful for the problems that I see in my life? Um, one aspect on trust that was really concerning is when I asked local leaders what would be helpful to a person in, uh, who was having a faith crisis, they responded that uh, general conference talks were helpful, talking with local leaders would be helpful, and when I asked the faith crisis members what they thought, they didn't think those resources were, were helpful. And as a matter of fact, in the 320 respondents, I think it was 310 respondents, um, not one of them strongly agreed that my local leader could help me navigate through my faith crisis. So they, they didn't trust that local leaders understood these issues, would be able to understand that they're important to them, that uh, uh, they would be able to, to help them know how to navigate them and have a path that would allow them to reconcile the concerns and the issues that they had. Wow, that's really significant because if there's no actual physical person locally, then, then, then there's Where no they go? <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and then of course, so then I, I take it that means that people found more help um, like on the internet. Yeah. So when, when you ask them, where did they find help? Um, they say that it's really on the internet with blogs, podcasts, social media, kind of the virtual communities that get created there. And, you know, I know those communities pretty well. Some of them do provide good support for members in these circumstances. And there's some good organizations that are out there that are promoting ways for these people to, um, uh, know where to go next with their faith, given, um, you know, some sort of trigger that causes them to have concerns. And then there's a lot of groups that that um, don't have an agenda to help people move back in a faithful way. Um, and everyone kind of has to decide what resonates with them. But, but absent something in a bishop's office or in a sacrament meeting or in a general conference talk or on LDS.org, um, these members need help, and they tend to find it where they can find it. Right. So there's not a kind of personal infrastructure right now yeah. dealing with that. I mentioned that um, these local leaders uh, recognize that addressing faith concerns is really important for them. I also asked them a question of whether they're getting training from their stake leaders on how to address these issues. And, and they're not getting much training at all. So I think about 20% said they're getting some sort of training from their stake leaders to help them know how to address this. And then I even asked them whether they felt like the materials coming from the church were, would, were helpful to address this. And about half the leaders said they were helpful and the other half said they weren't helpful. So I think there's an absence of material. I don't think it's a surprise 
but someone could end up in a bishop's office and say, Bishop, I have a concern. And the bishop not first, not even knowing what the issue was. And then second, not even helping the member find some way forward in faith with that issue. Interesting. So that's the lack of trust. Um, talk to me about belonging. So belonging is kind of a concept that's important to all of us. All of us need to feel connected to people. And um, uh, our church congregation is one place where we can feel connected. But many of these members feel um, like they've lost that connection. And I think they feel that way for a couple of reasons. One is when they raise a concern sometimes, like in a gospel doctrine class or a Relief Society meeting, they're often not met with a warm reception. If they raise kind of a prickly issue, sometimes the person next to them will kind of shift in their body language. And sometimes a person across the room will testify that whatever they said is wrong. Right. And, and so they just, they feel like their concerns aren't welcome. You know, that they aren't welcome. And it's not always a concern like a church history concern. It's a, it may be a concern about... Uh, the way they see the world or the way they live their life. Um, if they're a woman and have a career, maybe they feel um, that they that part of their life um, that caused them to go into being a, a professional isn't isn't kind of welcome in the dialogue. Um, we can have a class on eternal marriage and people who um, are, don't have eternal marriage in their life. Um, may may feel um, unwelcome or may feel like they're lesser than something. There's a lot of different dimensions to belonging. When I asked these faith crisis members whether they felt comfortable that they could disclose their level of faith to their the members of their congregation or even to the leaders, most of them said no. I think only about 20% felt like, and, and I'll, I'll just read the question here, um, 20% felt like they could be their honest self and disclose their level of belief um, to their ward or to their leaders. Uh, and I think the reason is, is, is they start to kind of open up and raise a kind of a safe question. They get shut down so they know they can't raise the harder questions. Mm. So they, they end up just kind of being alone on those questions. Um, and they, they go to church, but they come home without feeling like the issues that are important to them are, are welcoming even to be discussed. Interesting. So um, talk to me about meaning. What do you mean by that? So um, each of us has concerns in our lives. Um, many of those concerns um, are spiritual. Not all of them are, but many of them are spiritual. And, and, and that's kind of the way we think. Uh, th these are the things that are important to me understand my identity, understand um, how I solve my day-to-day -day problems. And some people who go to church just feel like the issues that are important to them are never addressed. So if, if I'm struggling economically, for example, and I'm working two jobs, and I'm really living hand to mouth, and I go to church and I pay my tithing, um, but still I'm living hand to mouth, and all I hear is about the great blessings that will come in store to me. That doesn't really provide a pathway for me to, to resolve kind of my day-to-day -day, um, uh, living on the edge. Um, if, if I'm concerned about social issues in the world or in my own life, uh, if I'm concerned about um, issues of uh, sexism or sexual violence or racism that, that I experience every day or are important to me, and I don't find um, that those issues are, are discussed, even though they're clearly part of the Savior's message. Um, then, then I say, where do I go to uh, kind of address those issues in my life and find context on how to live or find a way to create a world change, or at least a change in, in my life with regards to, to those issues? If, if I'm on the other side of those issues, if I've been a victim of sexual violence or you know, struggle with mental health issues or find myself as a, as, as a, as a minority or a, a different person in a congregation, um, I need that reassurance that I'm still um, uh, one of uh, our heavenly parents' children and that, that the universe of God's creations include me uh, when I feel so different. And so 
I, I may not feel like the church has messages that relate to me, um, that answer the questions that I'm struggling with, that paint me a, a path of spirituality going forward. And so I find places to do that. And, and they may not be um, inside the church. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is that, um, talk about trust, belonging, and meaning. Some of it is stuff that, um, that let's say, rank and pile Latter-day Saints can't really control. You know, we are not setting policy for the church. We're not um, preaching in general conference. But what I um, also hear is that there's so much that we could do just at our local level in terms of the kinds of discussions that we have in our, you know, on Sunday, in our lessons, um, in family home evening, um, ways in which we can make it a safer space to bring up issues and make it more, um, more possible for people to um, have discussions. I mean, when you talk about this gap between um, what the leaders see, local leaders see, and what faith crisis members are feeling or experiencing, there's, a, I'm noticing this, this fear kind of on both sides. So, um, you know, there's this fear on the side of the faith crisis members of, you know, disclosing their levels of belief for their real selves because they're afraid that they'll be, um, they'll be looked down upon or seen as wicked or offended or whatever. But then there's also fear on the side of um, leaders to kind of bring, bring this into the open, bring the fact that people have doubts or, or very concerning questions into spaces. I think we sometimes worry about um, contagion or worry about this idea that um, you know, if, we, if we dare to acknowledge that sometimes we don't know or um, we don't have complete faith, then it will just kind of set off a chain of dominoes and then no one will have any faith. What do you think we can do at the local level? Well, I mean, I think the, the fear that leaders have is a real fear. I think that the best way to deal with that fear is to talk about it. I, I don't think that in the day and age that we live in, where information is available at the click of a mouse, that we will control the information that our church members will consume. Um, they will be exposed to um, all the issues um, that are out there probably at some point in their life. At different points in times, they'll have to consider those and understand how it um, impacts their faith and their belief in the way in which they live their life. I think we are far better when we talk about these issues and create a, a framework of faith that allows these issues to be dealt with in context of the reality of those issues. And um, I asked a question of leaders and of faith crisis members, does addressing doubt create more doubt? And um, both groups responded about the same. Only about 20 or 30% of leaders and, and faith crisis members felt like talking about doubt creates more doubt. Now, they all may be wrong. You know, I don't know the answer, and so much of this is above my pay grade. Um, but I do know that um, if we don't talk about it, that as people are exposed to it, they do need to figure out how to process it. And if we don't create a faithful place for them to process that, they will go to places where they can process it. And it all, won't always be a, a, a place where alternative, faithful, paths uh, are discussed or considered. So you've said that oftentimes the local leaders, let's say the Relief Society president, the Young Women's president, um, members of the bishopric, might not even know about the issues. Where would you recommend that local leaders go to educate themselves so that they're better positioned to respond to concerns from faith crisis members? Yeah, I mean, I don't think a local leader needs to um, have a PhD in difficult church history topics or, you know, cultural or whatever. Um, I don't think they have to be um, uh, the experts. Wasn't one of our general authorities said, you know, just because I'm a general authority doesn't mean I'm an authority on everything. You know, find an expert that does. I think the more important thing is for a leader to not be afraid when a member comes in front of them with a concern. 
and not say, well, it must be the member's fault. They must not be reading their scriptures enough, or they must have some sort of secret sin that I can't see that has triggered their crisis of faith. I, I think there is a pattern to minister to people that have questions. And I think that's something that our leaders, if they learned and understood how they could approach that ministering opportunity across the desk from them or with their arm around them, it doesn't have to be, we always sometimes talk about bishops here, but it's it's whoever has a relationship with someone who's trying to support them um, as they try and come unto Christ. If, if we can learn how to minister better to these people that question, um, I, I think we can address um, the issues uh, that that um, trust, belonging, and meaning kind of underpin. Thank you. Um, just looking over what we've talked um, what we've talked about here, some people might say um, these. Um, these kinds of issues that people have, um, you know, being concerned about some issues like sexism or racism or poverty, as opposed to being concerned about other issues like, um, I don't know, eternal families or um, going to seminary every day or something like that. Just, just one set of issues as opposed to another set of issues. Um, are just evidence that these young people today or, or these people who are concerned in these, you know, these issues that we are not used to talking about at church, they're just on the wrong track. They just don't get the gospel. What would you say to that? You know, I, I've lived in a lot of different cultures and countries. I've lived in India, I've lived in Africa, I've lived in Europe, I've lived in different parts of the United States. And one of the things I've kind of come to believe is that um, and I think the scriptures in 2 Nephi chapter 29, the Lord speaks to us based on our understanding. And um, I think he meets us in the, I think he wants to meet us in the needs that we have at the moment. And um, uh, so if, if I've got a concern about a particular issue that, that the gospel has a powerful message to address, I think the Lord would want that message to be, <laughs> used to address that concern in my life. Um, and, and I think um, generationally, generations do have different concerns and different issues that are important to them. And um, as I look through the data, it's apparent that um, millennials or Gen Z generation um, have different kinds of concerns than I do. Um, they, they have concerns about issues of social justice. They have concerns about um, uh, uh, gender roles, uh, sexual orientation, uh, transparency, um, in a way that my generation just really hasn't had. And one of the challenges that we have in, in a, a leadership structure in, in local congregations is often um, there is a generational divide between the leaders and some of the members that are struggling with particular issues. And um, if, if I, as a 60-year-old, am, am the bishop, uh, absent a lot of work on my part, I may not be sensitive to the concerns of a, a, a millennial couple trying to raise you know, their two children competing in a, in a different marketplace than I did and with different concerns. So I don't think we minimize um, the issue that the person raises. I think we figure out how to take the message of, of Jesus Christ to the concern that they have um, in a way that resonates with them so that they can incorporate that into the journey in their life based on the experiences that they have and they will have, which will be different than yours and mine. Mm. Thank you so much for that answer. That's really helpful. I hope it's not too cheeky to ask a follow-up question, which is, I think, a difficult question because I myself don't really know how to answer it. But then what do you do when um, you have people who have very strong, cult, you know, distinctive cultural experiences, positions, perspectives, who take from the gospel um, teachings that at a kind of practical level are 
opposed to each other. Within a congregation, you could have, for example, um, members who have extremely different ideas about um, LGBTQ issues, about um, issues about you know women's roles. Uh, how can we minister to everyone while um, maintaining, I guess collegiality is not the right word, maintaining brotherhood and sisterhood in the word? That's a really interesting question. And I've done a lot of thinking about that. Um, part of the research that I did was to understand what counsel we've been given about how to minister. Um, we have a lot of talks, uh, general conference talks and in leadership meetings throughout stakes and wards that talk about the importance of ministering, identifying um, that Christ asked us to minister, that we're supposed to look out for other people. But I haven't found a, a lot of um, kind of authoritative information on how to minister. So what does that mean? If, if I've got someone sitting next to me at church that is very different than me and sees spirituality or has different life experiences or concerns that are very different, what do I do with them? Um, and what I have kind of come to learn on this is that, that there are skills that we can develop individually and skills that we can teach in our local congregations that help us be better at this. And, and the, the skills that to me are so important are listening and, and accepting that what the person is telling us is really real to them and important to them and might include perspectives and experiences that are so different than mine that I might not understand what they're really saying and take the time to try and really understand. I remember um, in some of this research I did, I interviewed people um, that uh, no longer believe like they did. And um, I talked to this one young man, he's not a young man, he's in his thirties, but uh, he's young to me. And um, you know, he did all the right things in the course of his life that, that we'd want a young man to do. You know, went to seminary, went on a mission, married in the temple, and it was a full tithe payer, all of that. And two or three years ago, one of these issues hit him. And now he doesn't trust the church and doesn't feel like he belongs. And so for an hour, he told me about his experience and his journey. And at the end, he said, Dave, I just want to thank you for listening to me. Um, no one has taken the time to understand um, what has happened with my belief. And um, I think from the tone of his voice, I did it over the telephone, so I couldn't see whether he had moist eyes or not. But from the tone of his voice, I think there were moist eyes. And um, that story has happened to me in many of the interviews that I've done with these people. Um, they don't feel like people want to know their experience or want to know what they felt. And because of that, they can't feel trust or belonging with those people. So it's the bishop across the table that really doesn't want to hear what that person is saying and why they feel that. Will want to judge and figure out what they've done wrong or want to take the time to testify to them and tell them what they should do differently instead of just being present and accept that what they're going through is difficult and challenging it might leave them alone. They may not even feel comfortable talking to their spouse um, or their parents on these kinds of issues. So they're alone and maybe angry and isolated. And if we just learn how to listen to them um, and put our arms around them and say, tell me about your experience. Um, you know, share with me what you would like to help me understand where you are. And then go through all of the affirming aspects of listening. Say, tell me more, and I see, and uh, I can understand, and not turn it back to ourselves, not in our minds try and formulate the perfect response that will dispel their, you know, wrongness of belief, but just accept where they're going. And I think it allows um, us to learn something about them that may, in fact, be helpful to ministering to them. But more than that, it probably uh, provides a level of healing and connection with them, with us, um, that certainly wouldn't be there without us doing that. And I don't think we're at times really very good listeners. 
That's true. Um, we're doing too much challenging and testifying, not enough listening. Um, thank you so much. That's really helpful. And I like what you said. Um, you know, I asked you the question about resources. You know, are there things that have been written down? Are there essays somewhere? And what I'm hearing is the most important thing is just creating space in our relationships because that kind of community that we have and the relationships that we have with each other as sisters and brothers are as real as, as anything else in the church. So by transforming that space, um, we, we do transform what um, the, both the institution and the culture with which these um, members are wrestling. Is there anything else that you'd like to say that we haven't already covered? You know, if, if I were a bishop again, and I was a bishop and I didn't know anything and I'm not sure I know anything now, but, but I would try and um, find ways in which to teach these kinds of issues into a congregation. Uh, I, I think having talks on how to listen, how to withhold judgment, how to validate the concerns that other people have, even if we might accept them or might disagree with those concerns. Um, I think those are uh, part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's what uh, Christ's ministry was about, was perceiving people for where they were and knowing how to help them along their path. It's also very individual. And with, with, without us as congregations learning how to do that, or without us, when we attend church, learning how to do that individually, I think we will find um, that, that this issue um, won't go away. Maybe it never goes away, but uh, I, I think we will find that uh, this gap between the efforts of leaders um, versus the perceptions of members that are in this challenging faith moment, uh, that that gap remains in a way um, that the Savior wouldn't want to have. Um, the Savior knows us all. He knows us in a perfect way, in a way that none of us will ever know the person sitting next to us. But we can learn from his example, and we can teach about that example in a way that we can elevate our capability as members to minister and to be able to really create a setting at church that is a ministering setting where people can go and feel like they belong, where we have enough diversity in our topics that we're covering the meaning that is required by, you know, most of our members at, at the ward, um, where we can develop trust in each other, knowing that if I say something that's a little different than the norm, that, that people are still going to accept me and still um, kind of respond to me in a way that, that builds that close relationship. Uh, and I think that's what the message of Jesus Christ is all about. So I, I would hope we could do that better in our local congregations. Wow, thank you so much for taking the time to share these, um, this information and then also these further reflections. I think that's so helpful for me just as a tool um, to remember how to um, listen. I'm actually, um, you know, in parenting, these situations come up all the time. I'm like the worst. I'm the worst listener in working on that. Um, so what, what I will do is I will, um, in addition to this interview, I'll post um, some links that you provided me and those links can accompany this interview and people can go to those, um, to your links for, um, for further information about the survey and also your further recommendations that you've written in other blog posts. So thank you so much for taking the time. That's Thanks, Melissa. Good to talk to you.